My name is Julian Carrington. I'm the managing director at the Racial Equity Media Collective. And um, it's really fantastic to be able to share our new report with you today, especially here at Real World. Um, I was an intern at Real World something like a decade ago. Uh, so it's really fantastic to see uh, just the strides that this organization has made and especially this wonderful summit. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a really perfect venue to be launching our report for the first time. Um, before we, we jump into our discussion, uh, I'm joined obviously by three wonderful panelists. So we have John Christou from NFB, we have Renez Lantan from Telefilm Canada, and Marcia Douglas from the CMF. Um, maybe just briefly I can invite each of you to, to just quickly touch on what it is that you do at those organizations. Sure, yeah. So uh, I was actually an independent producer for a long time. I uh, joined the NFB in 2019, and I'm now the Director of Production and Operations for Programming and Creation, which means I work with uh, studios across the country in both French and English to develop practices, policies, workflows, and uh, making sure all of our projects are running smoothly. I, too, was an independent producer. Uh, started at the Canadian Film Centre in 90, and then produced my first film in 93 and worked through that for about 20 some odd years. And in 2018, I went to the CBC where uh, I headed up the Breaking Barriers Fund and then we rebranded it to CBC Films. And the fund prioritized uh, diversity. It was a very exciting time to see that take place in, in the broadcasting uh, landscape in Canada. And I joined Telefilm in, uh, oh boy, uh, 2020, what year are we in? Uh, 20, I've, I've been there almost two years. So December, uh, the end of December will be two years at Telefilm. And I am the national director for feature film for the English market. And my team, we oversee all phases of production from development, production, big budget, low budget, talent to watch, uh, theatrical documentaries, the marketing and distribution fund, and we work with uh, Fran's team with international promotion as well, and film festivals, so uh, it's nice to be here, thank you. It's hard to follow Marinez and John. <laughs> um, my name is Marcia Douglas, I'm the Vice President of Growth and Inclusion at the Canada Media Fund. I too am a reformed producer or more understand how hard that is. So um, I had a film premiere at TIFF in 2004. That's a long time ago now. Um, and I can tell because my oldest was five weeks old at the time. So truly, I can tell you it is longer to make a film project than it is to have a child. Um, <laughs> uh, I've worked a variety of places, uh, some of the private funds. I spent some time at the Canadian Media Producers Association and I uh, was privileged to land at the Canada Media Fund about a year and a half ago. Uh, my team at the Canada Media Fund is in charge of uh, policy and efforts to help advance a more inclusive um, and growing industry. So we um, manage the sector development program amongst many other things. And I have the um, privilege of also working with our ASI team and Richard is somewhere here um, from that team too and we work together on data collection, which is why we're here. So congrats Julian on the report. Thank you. Um, very much looking forward to jumping into the conversation with uh, you all. In 2022, both the CMF and Telefilm launched new data collection initiatives. The CMF introduced its Persona ID data collection system and Telefilm launched its self-identification questionnaire. Both of these systems allow key creatives to share self-identification information that can be used to assess eligibility for funding programs, inform the decision-making process at your organizations, as well as to provide a broader understanding of what kinds of creators are accessing opportunities at each organization, uh, helping to identify where gaps may exist. One of the core recommendations of the RMC report is that data collection be harmonized to the greatest extent that is practical. So I'd love to start with a question about you know, to what extent are there currently communication or coordination between your organizations as to what kind of metrics are being gathered? And does that communication extend to discussions around how data can be used to inform program design or target setting? So maybe, Marsha, I'll start with you and, and Marinez, feel free to, to jump in as well. Happy to. I think um, just for everyone to, I, to take half a step back, you talked about sort of a data-informed, research-informed approach to both data and decision-making, and that's part of 
um, how CMF approaches all of its work. And I want to add a layer to that, which is, I think, another piece that we are trying to do more, which is to be more community informed. So before we even set up Persona, we did a lot of outreach to communities and with other organizations, including people on this stage, to figure out um, how we could best align, how to be responsive, how to cultivate, to your point, like respectful approaches to this work. Um, is there more to be done? Yes, we're learning as we go and we continue to try to have these dialogues um, because I think it's really important. And I think a piece coming out of your report um, and we're kind of trying to get there, but it's still that terminology, that lexicon pieces of, if we can be measuring, even if we don't have one tool, but we're measuring the same data in the same way, then it will all help us to also get a better snapshot. Because what we know right now then, and we know what we know based on what's coming in, but we only know what's happening at CMF. Um, but it is a piece that all of our teams will look at. Um, our ASI team is amazing. We actually have quite a number of people who are currently looking through this, but we had, I looked up the numbers, it was over 1,700 funded projects last year, so the ability to sort of crunch through that um, and look at what participation looks like in many ways, including, as you mentioned earlier, intersectionality, um, is a piece that we're working through to sort of, as I said, understand how we know what we know, but we are having really open dialogues with Telefilm, especially because we share some IT backend tools as well. Um, in the interest of trying to also look at that user experience and the experience of the people, both to cultivate psychological safety and privacy and respect that will hopefully build buy-in, um, also for efficiency, <laughs> um, um, and you know, to sort of honor the spirit of this. Um, but there's, there's more work to be done, and we, we continue to try to open those doors. Shall I just jump in here? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, the key being here that data provides us with a model for transformational change. And Telefilm embarked on this in 2022. And one of the most exciting pieces is, in addition to our annual report, the EDI report is out there, and also our findings of the data collection report is also out there. And I mean, I can say that our goal really right now moving forward, and this is where we can all work together, is creating a holistic, sustainable, and inclusive ecosystem um, so that we can set progressive, I'm reading my spiel here because it's very specific, so bear with me, so that we can really look at data-driven objectives and track that progress. So when we started this, um, and it started with you know, the initiatives that Telefilm took in 2020, and those seeds were planted, and we're seeing that germination. And it started with Kathy Wong, who was hired as our VP for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And she drafted through community engagement and collaboration and consultation. We had EDI working groups, we had subcommittees, and from that came uh, the uh, EDI action plan that set specific goals for 18 months, three years, and five years. So now that we're in 2023, we're seeing that take shape. And we're seeing that volume increase through all our programs right across the board, particularly in development where it starts with your story is, is key. And through that, we created uh, a couple of years ago the Black and Racialized Stream for emerging talent and also focusing on identity and who's telling whose story. And in doing so, what's exciting is that we're seeing the numbers just increase exponentially. So two years ago, as an example, we had a 16% increase in applications. And this year, we had a 38% increase. So that means it's a 54% increase in development. So with that, our goals are really to look at building capacity, training initiatives, mentorship, and collaboration. But I'll stop there. <laughs> um, I, I, it, it's great to uh, talk about and hear about um, the initiatives of both organizations. And, and Telefilm uh, actually just re released uh, an annual report last week, including a data-focused report. Uh, so there's no question that we're seeing within the organizations uh, great strides. But I am curious, given um, the fact that as you alluded to, Marsha, you know, you, you share some in, some infrastructure, um, informational infrastructure at the very least. Um, are there opportunities for your organizations to 
to coordinate in that way, to, to talk to one another about, okay, how are you going about this? What are you collecting? Let's compare notes a little bit. Um, what I'll start with just also as part of our promise for Persona, and I, I'm sure Telephone's the same way, we don't have any access to their EDI data and they don't have ours, so like that's part of the terms of use and, and part of building these systems is that privacy and confidentiality. So it's not as easy as you're saying to a degree. I will say um, kudos to Telefilm and its report and like the deep dive of like so much there. Um, we're working through ours. We will like, there's some in our annual report which was published in August. We weren't ready yet. We're still working through it. I think you can look forward to us publishing something probably early next year. Um, because that was also part of our promise to communities was to be more transparent and accountable, as you said. Um, it is about building bridges, and certainly we have a unique relationship and tie with Telefilm, who administers all of the CMF programs. For those who might not know, we couldn't do our work without Telefilm. But um, in addition to that, I think there's a conversation to be had, and, and it was part of our earliest conversations in building Persona. Um, with other organizations as well, so that we can learn from each other. We can learn from what's working well with other organizations to help us to improve. Um, and also engaging with communities to hear back from all of you. It sounds weird, this wasn't in my notes, but you know, we have a lot of ongoing consultations. We're open any time to feedback. You can call or email us. We even have a consultations email set up. Um, because we want to make this work better because, as Marina said, it's important to informing our work and where this goes. Um, as the CMF continues to evolve, we have to report to government. We, a lot of our funding comes from the government. Thank you, government. Um, that helps us support all of you in your work. Um, but there's accountability with that. Um, and so reporting on some of these numbers or having a better understanding of who's participating in our programs is part of that accountability, both to you, to the industry, and to the government as well. So we're, we really do try to, to find and build those bridges. But even like, John, it's fantastic to see here. We don't get to work together as much, but it would be great to hear what's working at the NFB, like how, um, how things are evolving and changing. And you mentioned gender earlier, um, which I think is interesting because we've all had different initiatives in that way. And I think NFB has just launched its tool this year. Mm -hmm. um, but by virtue of doing that now, as opposed to when we launched Persona in 2021, 2022, um, you've maybe done certain things in a different way with a different mindset to that, that would be good for us to hear and learn about so that we can build this together. Yeah, that's a great prompt to bring John into the conversation. I, I understand that as a federal agency, the NFB has some slightly different um, sort of restrictions on when and how it can collect data, but yeah, I would love to know more about what, yeah, what no, your data absolutely. collection practices so we, look like. Um, Maybe I'll just start with a little bit of context because the NFB is a federal agency, so we've got a different status than CMF and Telefilm. And I didn't really know what that meant when I first started at the NFB. Um, and I like to use this example because it blew my mind when I heard, but the NFB doesn't even have its own bank account. <laughs> so every single check that we issue comes from the Treasury Board. Um, so we have a lot of different loopholes and we have a different administrative context, I think, than, than Telefilm and, and CMF. We're also um, susceptible to parliamentary questions and um, specific data requests from the government. So, um, you know, we, we are collaborating with CMF and Telefilm on how we build out our data system. But again, for privacy reasons, for uh, security reasons, we've, and, and, and also to be honest for, um, uh, expediency, uh, we decided to launch our own form and build our own data set. So uh, we launched um, a self-declaration form April 1st. They are all the exact same questions that Telefilm asks. So we did um, um, follow their lead in that sense so that we could have the same amount of data. We also built our form so that you only need to fill it in once. So if you work with us and uh, for the first time you fill in the form, you'll never have to fill it in again because we know that it's a big burden to be filling in forms constantly. And so we wanted to be conscious of that. It's also attached to contract. So you only, like, only, someone would only ever fill a form out with us if you're actually also filling out a contract to work with us. Um, so that's how we built our database. It's a little bit different from Telefilm and CMF. And uh, we've also launched it in phases. So in April, we've 
started only collecting data from directors, writers, DOPs, composers, basically key creative positions. Um, the way that we, you know, again, we're a, not a funder, we're a public producer. So that also puts us into a, a different category than Telefilm and CMF. So um, uh, what we do, the way we, the way we uh, categorize projects essentially is just based on the director. So if it's a racialized director, it's a racialized project, period. We don't worry about uh, any kind of you know producers or writers or anything like that. Is the director's racialized or indigenous, then the project's racialized or indigenous for us. So um, yeah, we have a bit of a different context. And the other thing I should say is uh, 80, 75 to 80% of our projects are 100% produced by the NFB, so produced in-house. We have 19 producers working across the country. Five of those 19 are indigenous. Four of those uh, 19 are racialized. So almost half of our producer group is either racialized or indigenous, which for us is also a very key way for us to diversify our slate because obviously uh, we want to be working, we want our employees to reflect the communities that we're working with uh, as well as our films. So we have a bit of a different status and one little thing I can share, I guess that's interesting is that um, out of the 180 directors we've sent the form to so far, 88% have responded, uh, which is really great. And that's, I think, because we were just really focused on directors to start with, and um, we just over-communicated. So if anyone in this room has filled out our form, I'm sorry if we emailed you five times about it. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know, that's sort of where we're at. Recently, at the end of August, uh, the NFB announced a target of 30% uh, of projects by 2025 by black and racialized creators. I'm wondering, again, how, how was that number arrived at internally? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, that was announced uh, just a few couple months ago, I guess August 31st. And the target, um, you know, we're, we're aiming to hit it by March 31st, 2025. Um, you know, we have about 180 projects currently on the go in all different phases from investigate, uh, development, and production. And so the first thing we uh, wanted to do in terms of being able to even come up with a number is have data, obviously, as we've been talking about. So we were, um, you know, the one of the main inputs has been the information we have and what does our slate currently look like, our slate of projects, so where are we at now? Um, maybe informally I can tell you that, that we're in the mid-20s right now. Um, so the official report will come up sometime in the spring, summer. Um, but like I was saying before, we did, you know, base our methodology or determination of what is considered a racialized project just based on the director alone. We've touched on uh, the benefits of, of sharing uh, this information, this, this data, reporting back to the public and to communities earlier, but I'd like to uh, dwell on that specifically now. So um, I know that the CMF presented some uh, equity data in the annual report. I know that there is a forthcoming specialized report. Um, we've also touched on telefilm. Uh, both the annual report and the specialized equity uh, data report came out last week. Um, I think you mentioned maybe the spring next year is when the NFB will have some data to share. Um, I'd love to know sort of going forward, um, do your organizations have plans to share the results of data collection um, in a regular way with the industry? Are there um, ways outside of annual reports um, for industry and community organizations to uh, access figures and insights from, from your organizations? Maybe, Marsha, I'll start with you. You shouldn't have sat at the end. Okay. Uh, uh, yes and yes. So uh, I am sure that we will continue to publish annually data. I think we are also in some of our conversations with other industry organizations, both these people and maybe even organizations like a CMP, for example, that is publishing profile, also working with other organizations. I think you know, the theme of some of your questions around how to use this information to help inform decision making, it is part of what we're doing. I think it's part of what a lot of people are doing. So it's trying to figure out how to get that out in a timely way and in a way that helps inform not only the decision making within our organization, I won't speak for both of you, but I'm sure it's the same, but also the, the broader industry, to your point. Um, I think the challenge has been, it's a lot to wade through. We had, as I said, 1,700 different projects. That does, it was over, I think, maybe 1,700 applications and 1,300 funded projects. It's, it's a lot, and we have that spread over 20 or 30 programs. And as I said, we, we look at a lot of different aspects of diversity. And so um, 
getting through that and figuring out how to push it out this first year is taking us more time than um, we thought it might, but it's it's with care and respect that we're taking that takes the time. Um, it will be faster, and that's a piece that maybe we can continue to talk about. I mean, but recognizing you, John, the NFB, I will also say all of us have different approval processes because of the governance of our organizations and or in terms of when something can go out, but I think it's a conversation that I think it's a part of the same conversation that we're having to make it easier for all of us and to make it easier for all of you. Does that make sense? No, it does. And also look at the, the methodology, the baselines, the targets. So I think we're, we're working towards that. We're definitely advancing that. And uh, it, the fact that we're having this panel and conversation right now, to me, shows that we are heading in that right direction collectively. Yeah. And I just add, I don't think it's just audiovisual. Like, I think no, there are it's other... right across the board. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at, at the moment, we actually, the NFB only has the right to look at the data in aggregate. We actually don't have the right yet to make any links between individuals and their answers. We've actually made a request to the government to be able to do that. But I think it is going to be a challenge for us at some point in the future in terms of sharing data with the community. I'm not sure we'll ever be able to share more than data in aggregate mm -hmm. um, because it's really not sort of outside of our mandate to be providing that kind of data, plus there's all kinds of, you know, obviously privacy and security reasons why we wouldn't. But uh, if our colleagues at CAFCO were to uh, maybe embark on, 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 on aiding in this, request, in this quest as well, there might be some more, um, they might have more leeway in, able, in, in order to be able to share a, a, a very broad base of data if they were to be collecting it. Just putting that out there. Sorry, Kafko, if you're here. <laughs> if um, we can bring the slide back up with the QR code for the report, because um, the report does conclude with these recommendations that include a, a pathway to the broader implementation of these sorts of policies. So the report really looks to the national agencies to kind of set the tone, set the agenda, set the example, and then bring along the private broadcasters as well, so that's addressed in there. There's also a section on the report that looks at the specific context of Quebec. So some of the questions that we're getting, the report does speak to some of that. So again, it's not the sexiest title uh, <laughs> of, of a document you've ever seen, but I think there's some good info in there. And uh, with that, I think we've got one last question here. So please do go ahead. So in light of the flaws of self-identification that we are all becoming uh, acutely aware of, Buffy St. Marie being the latest. Um, and in light of the fact that racism doesn't happen by self-identification. I don't say, oh, please discriminate against me because I'm black. You discriminate against me because you see me and you make a decision about who I am. And so I've always felt that this self-identification piece is a ploy to slow down the progress of really getting a level playing field. So I'm wondering why <laughs> we're spending a lot of energy around the self-identification piece when it is, it is not actually a part of the problem. The problem being the racism, the discrimination, the whatever. So yeah, that and the privacy piece. I don't understand, it, it just all feels like muddying the waters to what are the real issues of getting the people who are being discriminated against access to what they need access to. And hey, seven films, like when we made our feature film, we didn't go to telefilm because we knew there was another black film going to telefilm and they would never fund two, two black films in the same year. So seven films in one round is amazing. The question I have, however, is how many films in total were funded and what portion of that allocation were those seven films given? Oh boy, now you're making my mind. Now I have to come up with numbers and percentages of how many films we funded. Um, but we had 306 applications in the English market last year. We have, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you quite bluntly, we have a, a, it's extremely competitive. So we have about an 85% refusal rate. So out of that 306, we're looking at about 15%, which leads us to about 50 to 60 features. In, in big budget, if, if that's what you're focusing on, you know, this year was a monumental upheaval, as we all know, with the writers 
strike, the SAG strike. And in doing so, uh, we pivoted to looking at projects that could secure and close their financing. Um, our, our calendar year is according to the fiscal period, which starts April 1st, and we have to cash out by March 31st. So it gives producers a very short window to secure all their financing. So there's that piece as well. But I would say within that first round of big budget, we greenlit 14 films, of which seven were within the writer, director, producer, BPOC. So it's, again, in, 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 and Karen, I understand what you're, where you're, you're, the genesis of your question is ultimately, you know, how do we address the, the bigger barriers? But where data does come in, it does quantify, right? And, and it measures. And it, it, it forms the foundation for that transformational change. And we're starting to see that. Yeah, and I would also, just to add around self-identification itself, um, you know, we looked at all kinds of options. And, and for us, um, it just doesn't, didn't, never felt legitimate for any other way of identifying, for of having people identify themselves. You know, like it's not up to us to say, you know, who, who people are. Um, and uh, and so it's it's, a, it's it's complex in that sense. It's it's sort of the not the ideal way, but it seems like the only way, at least from all the options we've explored. And it's woven into the fabric now. We want it to be woven into the fabric. I I think honestly, and this is a boring answer. It's also a legal construct, and these rules exist to help actually protect people. But we use that self-identification as a basis for eligibility. So the pilot program for racialized creators that was mentioned, we use that data to ensure that only people from those communities are eligible for that funding. Um, so, but we are, it is a piece, and I'm sure you're the same, that we're very sensitive to as we look and design these programs, the forms, the, the pieces that we ask people for, that we really don't want to add more barriers or added requests of communities who have already faced barriers to participation just to participate. So that's the balance that we're trying to find. And if we're not getting it right, we would love to hear about that because we want to continue to take down barriers to access, not put more up. And it does help us shape those programs. So for example, with development in the black and racialized dream, we lifted all barriers. So we saw, okay, we're gonna measure this. This is the result the cause and the effect of that, and we removed that, so we made it much more open. So it does, it does create significant change. I think it's also one of the reasons why um, we haven't been working more diligently on a shared system, because I think all of us were like, we need to move to action, as opposed to spending a lot of time building this back-end shared system that would be very complicated to build. Because we did have a number of meetings between organized institutions to try to figure out you know, could we have a shared database? But, you know, the, the, the end result of those conversations where it would take a long time and it would slow things well, down. Let's get things moving. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm mindful of the time here. I think we do have to wrap it up. Um, I would just like to, to note that um, in, in, in relation to the question, and we didn't really get a chance to touch on it, but things like narrative positioning, which is a new uh, policy at, at uh, CMF, is going beyond sort of just, you know, how do you identify, but what is the relationship? What is your relationship to the community of the story that you're telling? And, and that's being asked in a way that's not just like checking a box, but, but asking you to actually, you know, describe and, and, and elaborate. And so I think going forward, that, that hopefully will be a broader approach uh, in storytelling, no matter who you are, not necessarily as a matter of your identity, but just, you know, where do you come from in relation to this story, racialized, gender identity, wh whatever it might be. So I, I hope we can see that, that become a bit of a norm. I'm afraid we do have to wrap it up. I will just say that, um, again, please check out our report and going forward, uh, the REMC, um, we plan to issue progress reports each year where we can hopefully act as something of a third party outside of these organizations, synthesizing the data that they publish, um, presenting that back against what they've committed to, et cetera, and just, you know, given all of the complexities and all of the challenges that can present in terms of how you work together, hopefully we can be in a position to to, to help provide that accountability, provide that feedback, um, and we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much.
I'm going to very briefly summarize the report. So when I say briefly, I, I, I mean briefly. Uh, this is a 42-page report. Um, <laughs> we're not going to get into to all of the nitty-gritty, but uh, there is a QR code there. Um, you can uh, download a copy of the report uh, via that QR code. There's also a summary report. So if the 42-page uh, phone book version is a little intimidating, there's a 17-page summary report that's also available via that same uh, QR code. And uh, yeah, would love uh, to have folks check that out. Um, but briefly, I can, I can provide a little bit uh, of information about what you'll find in it and about what the RMC does. So uh, some of you may know, but the RMC is a national not-for-profit organization uh, founded in 2019, committed to equity for BIPOC screen media creators. It is fueled by research and it is rooted in community engagement uh, with a mission to remove barriers to access and increase the production, export, and sustainability of BIPOC content and BIPOC-led production companies. With this report, we're seeking to establish clear research-informed guidelines and targets for the future of the Canadian screen industry. The report calls on major public agencies to harmonize their data strategies to create a national data system and urges the wider implementation of equity targets and quotas. A few more details about the report. Uh, it was um, funded uh, with the support of the CMF uh, and the research uh, support was provided by Nordicity. The report was co-written by us, the RMC, and Nordicity, and it is based on uh, interviews with representatives from over 40 industry stakeholders, including national, provincial, and territorial funders, broadcasters, professional associations, unions and guilds, festivals and industry events, BIPOC sector organizations, policymakers, and producers. So uh, that's how we got to 42 pages. We, we talked to a lot of folks. Um, it also provides a data-led analysis of the efficacy of targets and quotas based on findings both from uh, here in Canada and also from the UK, where uh, the diversity standards, uh, the BFI's diversity standards have been in place since 2014, so they had a bit of advanced data on, on uh, how those programs have been going. So we wanted to look to them and, and see what we could take away for, for our own context. Um, it also includes a set of recommendations uh, that urge a phased seven-step pathway for the development and implementation of a national data system and equity targets. So three core takeaways from the report. Uh, one is that harmonized data collection is key to achieving equity. You know, we all know from lived experience that BIPOC creators have faced barriers in accessing funding and, and other opportunities, uh, but we need data to reveal uh, precisely how our communities are participating in the media industry and where there are gaps or barriers to greater participation. And of course, before we remove those barriers, we need to locate and measure them in a quantitative way. So data collection can provide a baseline that will allow us to measure future change and also promote accountability. Currently, we have different organizations who are collecting data uh, in slightly different ways, and we lack a, a, a unified and ethical data system, ethical in this case um, primarily meaning one that respects privacy and um, that uh, you know, equitably uh, addresses um, uh, categories of identity and, uh, you know, is, is sort of in step with, with evolving conversations uh, in that space. Um, we, we lack such a system that could provide a comprehensive picture of the industry to produce insights that we can compare in a broad way. Our second takeaway is that data collection is crucial, but by itself not sufficient, we also need equity targets. So implementing tools such as targets and quotas will ensure that the gaps that are identified uh, are addressed, that policies are transformed into concrete actions, and that organizations are held accountable to their promises. Targets and quotas are increasingly being used in the Canadian and global screen industries to address underrepresentation among equity deserving communities. Um, and, and in some cases, those, those targets and quotas have had clear and positive impacts on the industry, and we've particularly seen that in the realm of advancing uh, gender parity, which has been very welcome. Um, but not all underrepresented communities have made comparable gains. So data uh, from the UK in particular uh, demonstrates the importance of designing equity tools in an intersectional manner. And our final takeaway that I will touch on here is that the report anticipates uh, challenges to data harmonization and goal setting and proposes solutions and some guidelines. So 
we know that there will be uh, hurdles to overcome, challenges to overcome. Efforts to harmonize data collection will require solutions to the issue of who governs a harmonized system, um, the technology that's employed, obviously there are privacy considerations, um, the terminology and categories of data that are, that are collected, uh, the scope of the uh, data collection, and also community trust. Um, we heard in a session yesterday with a representative of a union that um, on a recent uh, equity survey, they had something like 8% participation. And you know we need to make sure that people understand why uh, providing this data can benefit both themselves and the wider industry. So that community trust, that buy-in is a really key facet. Um, our research interviews yielded suggestions to tackle these issues, beginning with the creation of a steering committee and including a campaign to promote buy-in, again, among key communities. Uh, targets and quotas must be informed by sound data collection and community consultation. Population distributions can be a starting point to inform goal setting. If we're thinking about targets and quotas, of course, we can look at population distributions, but they are not necessarily themselves equitable uh, or reflective of equitable uh, representation in society. So goal setting, it also needs to be realistic, needs to be attainable, it needs to evolve in step with industry changes. And we recognize that there's not gonna be a one size fits all standard for the country. Uh, and of course, goal setting must be undertaken sensitively um, to minimize pushback or you know, to help people come along with us. So uh, that's all I'll say about the report for now. Again, the full report is available at the QR code. Um, I really do encourage you to check it out or the summary report. And um, with, with that now said, I'd love to jump into the conversation. Uh, so, 